<laughs> some Diné. We have so many languages in Alberta, so thank you for sharing that with us. Fantastic news, everybody. Groundbreaking, and it's going to be so impactful for the communities. Now, I'd like to thank our, our, all of our speakers today. Without their tireless effort and everyone involved, this landmark deal would not have been possible. So now I'll turn things over to Sam. Uh, he's going to moderate the, uh, the media Q&A. And thanks again, everybody, for, for joining us, especially so much press. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll now start our media Q&A portion. We'll be taking one question and one follow-up. Please make sure to state your name and outlet before asking your question. And if you could address it to who is best, that would also be great. We'll start off here in the room before making our way to the phones. First at the mic. Cool. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Emma Graney with the Globe and Mail. Um, Premier, this is not a question for you. Um, oh. So lucky you. Um, this is probably for um, probably Ms. Martin no, or Chief. Um, obviously, there are 72 separate communities that you've brought to the table here. Um, I'm curious what the challenges were to try and get so many communities to come together and actually agree, and what you see as a challenge opportunity, because this still has to go through and get voted, get given the okay, right, by different communities. So can you speak to that a little bit, please? Thank you very much for that question. And Chief, would you, wait there, I found you. Would you want me to answer first? Here, Sorry, um, did, you, hear did you hear the question about yeah. the challenges and opportunity of bringing together so many communities? Yeah, sure. Yeah, and Chief, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, maybe I'll start, but um, the, what I'll say is the AIOC has, has built a process around this, so we recommend and we help. Um, our organization acts as a bridge between the Indigenous communities and the corporate development teams, and we help to bring both sides together. Um, the Indigenous communities represented a consortium committee to um, represent them. Typically, that's based on geography, but um, in the case of the Métis settlements, it can, it can be among like-mindedness and common interests. Um, and then that group was then elected to carry forward the interests on behalf of the whole and act as a negotiating um, team. The AIOC team has been with um, this process right from the beginning. So I'll turn it over to Councillor Tom. Chief or Chief? Chief okay. first. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you uh, uh, for the question. However, you'll have to forgive me now that I'm getting a little older, I have problems with my hearing and with my eyesight and something else I can't quite remember. So anyways, uh, we have faced many challenges whenever indigenous um, people, indigenous uh, businesses want to be more actively involved in, in the various business sectors that are here. And so uh, in this case, not only are we facing those basic barriers that have impeded our full business participation in developing our resources, such as uh, capacity, such as capacity and expertise. A lack of access to capital is another barrier that has prevented us. And of course, sometimes uh, we don't always see eye to eye with other governments and their leaders. Uh, but that's good, you know, it, it makes us try harder. And sometimes we don't always see eye to eye with our own. But we continue. We continue because if there's one thing that brings people together, that thing is having a good business opportunity before you. And I think that's very key because we all realize this project is beneficial to everyone involved. The indigenous people, the First Nations people, the Métis people, TC Energy, government of Alberta. And so I think we have tried to keep that in perspective in the work. But mind you, our negotiating committee is, uh, did a lot of hard work. They were so determined to make this a success. Uh, yes, they had arguments. Yes, I had arguments with some of them. But that's part of what it is that we do in ensuring that a very be beneficial uh, outcome happens when you have trust, determination, and the sincerity to make a go of it. So we've overcome those uh, those types of uh, those types of, of barriers uh, as Indians uh, First Nations business people we have many 
barriers, but we're do dealing with them. And thanks to the government of Alberta, they have provided this, this opportunity where we can get access to capital. Before that happens, we still have to ensure that whatever project that we bring to the forefront has merit, has good business merit to it, and this one has. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, my follow-up, I'm sorry to get you out of your seat, uh, Ms. Pro, but it's actually for TC Energy. It's for you. Um, uh, can I... Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes. Sorry. No, 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 no trouble. Right. I just, you know what, something <laughs> keyed my mind when you asked the question about a barrier. Mm. And uh, I, I got excited about the answer because it adds to my speech before, as you can tell, I'm more calm now. Um, I think the biggest barrier about dealing with Métis communities and First Nation communities on these transactions is understanding each other's demographics. There's a long history behind the Métis settlements of Alberta that comes from 1990 and further back to 1938. And the Métis settlements of Alberta, of Alberta are land-based Métis, unique to Canada, and unique to Alberta, and unique to the world. So, and I'm excited to, to, to be here on behalf of a land-based Indigenous community and the recognition we've getting, been getting in past transactions and future transactions. So I think, you know what, short answer is understanding each other. And the friendships that we've built with energy, government, and my good friend, Mr. Makinima, now will continue and a better understanding for the future, together united, one path, one goal. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Sorry about not seeing you before. Um, so Mr. Pereira, um, obviously TC Energy right now, it does have a ton of debt and you've got your pledge to shareholders to sell off, what, $3 billion worth of assets. So can you speak to a little bit um, about the, I guess, meaningful partnership here versus your need to pay down that debt and your promise to shareholders to do so? Thank you for the question, Emma. And uh, geez, it's nice when you can kill two birds with one stone. Um, uh, we've been looking for years to find an opportunity to invite in our indigenous rights holders and partners uh, to become owners of some of our infrastructure. So uh, when the AIOC program came to be, uh, we started studying it to understand it. And uh, we quickly realized that it would be an opportunity for us to achieve two objectives. First is accelerate our uh, reconciliation with indigenous communities. And second, to achieve some of our other corporate objectives like reducing debt. Oh, I'll be honest with you, we have $100 billion of assets. We could have picked any number of assets to reduce debt. This is far more meaningful but it's not because of the debt production aspect, it's because as partners going forward, partners share information. We'll be developing projects together. As partners, our indigenous partners will be getting a very early look at every project we're developing and give us advice as to how to do things right, how to do things well. So we're a learning organization. We're gonna view this as an opportunity to learn. And if it accomplishes a corporate objective at the same time, all the better. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> Sean Polzer, Western Standard. This one's for the Premier. Um, I know that uh, AIOC is something that's uh, really near and dear to you. And just wanna say congratulations. Thank you. Um, but you also know Western Standard readers. <laughs> So how do I go back and and convince them of the benefits that uh, this truly is a good deal for everybody? Well, look, I mean, one of the things that um, is so attractive about this loan guarantee program and the way that, that Shanna and her team approach investments is, and we're, this is important to us because we want to invest in projects that are going to develop a great revenue stream for all of the partners, but also carry very limited risk of default to the taxpayers. The, the issue that we find in First Nations and Métis settlement communities is that they don't have the ability to go to the bank on their own to negotiate a deal like this be, just because of the unique ownership, communal ownership structure that they have on, on uh, the nation. And so that was, I think, the, the foundational insight that uh, the, the department had in, in advancing this program is that with us being able to use our ability to guarantee a loan, 
it uh, enables these kinds of these kinds of uh, purchases of equity ownership. So I would say that taxpayers should rest assured that uh, the, the diligent work that is being done uh, limits their uh, the the taxpayer liability to a very tiny tiny risk, but the benefit is enormous. I I know that before this um, this deal came through, I was talking about the 680 million in loan guarantees we had over seven projects that would deliver 1.2 billion dollars worth of revenue to the nations that had signed on, and uh, I told Shanna I'm going to need her to recalibrate what that new number is going to be. But you can imagine it's going to be just a, a substantial amount of revenues to each community that they can then use for their own priorities. I just, I just think it's a win all the way around. And yes, um, um, oh. Can I just add something? Um, I thank you, Premier, for that. And I just want to add really how I foundationally look at these projects. I'm a finance person by background. I'm also First Nations. Um, and I want to share a little bit with all of you how I think this these kinds of transactions. Um, I used to speak about making it a better Alberta, but it's now making a better Western Canada. Um, and really that these are driving economic activity into areas that aren't traditional economic powerhouses. So when you think about your readers in, let's talk about rural Alberta, if you now have more economic development going on in Kikino, Métis, um, Whitefish, Goodfish, Lake First Nation, I really encourage you to look at the video on our website. They talk about building an arena. And I want you to think about what an arena means for a community that hasn't had one. It means that there's a healthy place for youth to go and develop sport. And we all know that that association with healthy activities drives a healthier community and healthier individuals. It drives economic opportunities. They can host tournaments. All of the surrounding communities benefit from that arena. It drives jobs right from the construction, procurement, um, even the jobs, the concession stands, running them, that all drives productivity into regions that haven't had that. And that is generations of positive change. So I want you to multiply that 72 times over through this transaction and think about the positive impact on all of the neighboring communities and all of the communities that your readers live in. Um, more economic impact provides, Minister Wilson talks about having hope for a positive future that makes for a better Alberta and a stronger Canada. Thank you. And um, recently there's been a lot of criticism of uh, Parks Canada going back to the Jasper fire. And um, I think uh, former Minister Marr wrote a column, a pretty insightful one in the Globe uh, this morning or yesterday. And I'm just wondering if you think that criticism is warranted and whether or not uh, enough was done uh, what could be done in the future to prevent these kinds of things from happening again? Mm -hmm. Well, look, I mean, we have to pay attention to what the scientists are telling us and what the scientists have been telling us for years. And I've been reading the stories along with you, especially after the pine beetle kill and the fact that we have aging forests and the type of forestry that we have was created by fire. And so when you have forests that are 80 or 100 years old, there's only a few things that are going to happen. You either mechanically remove that, that fuel or you do prescribed burns to remove that fuel or nature will remove that fuel for you. And so we are, are very conscious of the fact that we have a lot of forests that we manage um, on our crown lands. And so that's why I asked Todd Lowen to take a look at the aging of our forest stands and see if we can develop a better way of managing that fuel. And on a go forward, uh, we have asked the federal government and they've agreed that we would be in unified uh, command, not only through this uh, current crisis, but also through to recovery. And I think that's going to include us um, asking some of those hard questions about what do we do to make sure that the 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 the, uh, the the fuel is removed in a in a, a way that makes sense for the age of the forest. So it's a long it's an ongoing discussion. That being said, on the on the day that the fire um, hit Jasper, we have to remember what the the firefighters were facing. It was a wall of fire that was three to four hundred feet high. It was two kilometers long. There was a fire on the north end of town and the south end of town that created the kind of in climactic conditions where they were pulling the wind at 125 kilometers an hour, which they had not seen before. So when you think of, is there anything that that forced uh, firefighting crew could have done in those specific circumstances? Uh, you know, I think by, by the time it got to that point, they, they, they did the best they could and 
kudos to the structural firefighters who stayed behind fighting the fires even though some of them lost their own homes to make sure that they could protect as much as the, of the town as they did that's that's uh, once you get to that situation you, you you have to make sure that you're taking decisions that are going to preserve life and preserve uh, and, and they made a decision that as well to preserve as much property as they could and I, I think we should we should congratulate the the firefighters on what they did there Hi there, Sarah Often with Global News. This question is for Chief Roy uh, or Councillor Tom. Um, members of the agreement um, of this agreement are going to be invited to join uh, TC pardon Energies. Pardon me, could you speak up a bit? Oh yes, yeah, sorry. So members of this agreement, um, it said, are going to be invited to TC Energies Indigenous Advisory uh, Council. What influence do you hope that those members are going to bring to TC Energy? What influence do you hope that they'll have? Um, and, um, you know, per perhaps what changes would you like to see or what's been missing in the past? Okay. Well, already uh, members of the consortium committee and, of course, our negotiators are already providing a better insight on our perspectives when it comes to engaging in business uh, uh, partnerships uh, I you know one of the key factors that we that we agree on whether you're indigenous Canadian American Japanese or or other is uh, is uh, uh, is the availability of a good business deal you know uh, I've made uh, business deals with uh, the second largest trading house in the world, the Sumitomo Group, about 30 years ago with respect to one of our um, uh, production, processing, and marketing arrangements where we export one of our um, agricultural projects. So it's, a, you know, it's a, the Japanese and, and ourselves, we uh, have certain um, qualities, qualities that we share trustworthiness is such a big factor in doing a good business deal and that is what our consortium committee that is what our um, our um, um, inclusion into the mix will bring hopefully you know we will begin to deal with matters in a, in a trustworthy way too long you know industry and indigenous people have been have been fighting. I think the more we know about each other will only uh, uh, produce uh, a better understanding and hopefully a more trustworthy uh, atmosphere. I hope I've tried to answer your, your question. Well put, thank you. Uh, second, oh sorry, please. I can, uh, <clears throat> so I being on the uh, consortium committee, uh, full time for the beginning to, to now, understand that we are allocated one position from our consortium and what benefit it brings to the uh, Indigenous uh, Advisory Committee for, for TC is the knowledge of this deal. And that's the key, right? So the knowledge of how we came to where we are today and what steps, what monumental like uh, the stages we came to, uh, targets, and, and that I think is a good thing. That's a huge benefit for TC's Advisory Committee. Thank you, Councillor Tom. Second question for the Premier, please. And I apologize, it's slightly off topic. I, I know that be, happening behind closed doors right now in the City of Calgary, um, there's discussions about possible cost overruns with the Green Line. Um, will your government commit to funding the Green Line even if uh, the scope changes to mitigate those cost overruns? We have agreed to fund the Green Line to the tune of $1.53 billion. And we have asked them if they are going to go beyond that to rescope the project. We, th we think there's an opportunity to do that with the uh, new events district, as well as with the potential to integrate into City Hall. So w what our hope would be is that uh, they would be realistic about what the costs are going to look like and make sure that they build the, the maximum length so that it reaches into the maximum number of communities. And we have conveyed to them that um, our $1.53 billion investment is firm. Hey, Tim Brook with CTV. I'll start with you because you're up there. Sure. Um, I, I, we've seen more, um, I guess, participation when it comes to the economy uh, throughout Indigenous communities as of late. 
it, it mainly seems to be focused on energy, right? We have uh, this announcement today, Trans Mountain and Bridge agreements. Would you like to see that that kind of broaden its scope at all? And if so, in what direction would you like to see that go? Well, I certainly would get um, Minister Wilson to speak to that because I know we expanded when we increased the loan guarantee to $3 billion, We expanded out the number of sectors that would be available. The main thing that we've been looking for are deals that are already in operation, already earning a good revenue stream, already a proven project, because that then not only guarantees the revenue stream for nations but and uh, settlements, but it also uh, guarantees or uh, provides minimal risk to, to taxpayers. So those are the, the unique kinds of projects that we're looking at. But I'll turn it over to Minister Wilson to, to tell you the kind of things they're looking at. Yeah, we've, we're open to other investments, uh, agriculture, forestry, uh, renewable projects. We've got several of those already in the works. Uh, one other area I'm, I'm really looking at uh, is getting into tourism. Uh, I, I think it really fits in well with the with the Indigenous communities, and uh, we've we've had some studies done that one in three people coming to Alberta wants to have an Indigenous experience when they come here. So I think there's a real opportunity there. Uh, we're also looking at transportation uh, projects, uh, wireless. So there's lots of other opportunities out there, but. Uh, when we brought Shanna on board, I, I did tell her that uh, get lots of projects, but don't lose a nickel. So <laughs> she's very frugal, and she's making sure that they're all good projects, and our energy projects are the ones that uh, tend to make the, the most sense and the, and the most dollars. But we are open to other projects, and I know they are reviewing some at the time. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Chief Fox, I have a question for you. Go ahead. Um, just, just in a broad sense, in, in your mind, how important is um, economic self-determination to reconciliation? Well, let me begin by saying that uh, most many of us have all, for many years, we've talked about sovereignty, okay? But you really can't have true sovereignty until you have financial sovereignty, until you can garner your own source of funding. Business is the best way to do that. That's why we've engaged in, you know, in business uh, agreements, business partnerships with the, the Japanese, the South Koreans, the Emirates, the Saudis, my cousins, the British, my uh, relatives, the Irish, and the Americans. You know, we, we have built an industry wherein we are the largest irrigation farm in Canada. We are, have a company that was developed with the help of, of both governments, the federal and the provincial government, many years ago, and involvement with uh, 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 others uh, in that particular sector. And, and we've come to realize, come to realize that Yes, it's good that gov other governments ta are talking about reconciliation. But when that process started a few years ago, it didn't really mean much to us. There was nothing tangible that went with the crocodile tears, if I may say so. So in this case, the Alberta government, uh, the previous uh, uh, leader, uh, uh, Premier Smith's uh, uh, um, um, the the previous uh, previous premier of Alberta, uh, Jason Kenney, started this organization. It was more narrow than what it is now. It really just talked about uh, Indigenous people getting involved in the energy sector, more so in the conventional energy sector. Now, as mentioned, you know. They've got, it's gone into other, other business sectors, agriculture, tourism, uh, manufacturing. So, you know, that is it's so important when other governments talk about reconciliation. So important to back up those words. And in this case, this is what has happened. You know, it was such a good thing that um, the former Premier Kenny started that we made him an honorary member of the Ghana chieftainship yesterday at a very sacred ceremony at Akukatsis. Some people call Akukatsis the Sundance, but he was inducted into this uh, society which is 106 years old. 
and it is there to honor those people who have done good, not just for Ganak, the Blood Indian, all indigenous people, all Albertans, all Canadians, all North Americans, all people of the world. So, you know, they've led the way. And I think Alberta continues to lead the way.